Merry Christmas, Emmanuel. Merry Christmas. Isn't that fun? <laughs> what a joy to be together today. And I see many of you got the memo and are dressed in Christmas finery and reds and greens. Oh, it's wonderful to look out and see all of you. It's a great, great morning. And I'm just thinking, we may like this so much, we make it a permanent thing. We'll just move <laughs> Christmas from December to July. <laughs> Disney yeah, Sunday. What? Let's do Disney Sunday. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> well, we, um, I'll tell you how this all got started. It's, it's because of the tie I'm wearing. Uh, it's got Santa Claus on it, and he's laughing uproariously. And somebody commented on the time, and, and uh, uh, appreciatively, and said, "I said, well, it's uh, you know, it's too bad I can only wear it once a year." And they said, "Well, why not about why not Christmas in July?" And I went, "Oh." <laughs> Started thinking about it, the more I thought about it, the more that seemed like a fun idea. So here we are. And it happens to coincide with the Sioux Falls Municipal Band doing a Christmas music concert this Thursday. So uh, we, that's uh, parallel planning is what we call that. And where will they be? They will be at um, uh, McKinnon Park at, did I write down the time? 7.30. Thank you, Joe. So we encourage you to continue the Christmas spirit all week and then attend that concert as well. Um, one of the Christmas things is uh, giving gifts. And rather than go into some kind of gift exchange between us, uh, we thought it would be uh, more fun and more appropriate even to have a gift giving to local charities. So we have designated uh, the Furniture Mission, the Gospel Mission, the uh, Lunch is Served, and Glory House to be recipients of our Christmas gifts. So we have four folders on a table in the foyer. If you have cash, we want to invite you to stuff them in there and uh, make a gift to these local Christian charities uh, for Christmas. And I, I'll have the happy duty of taking them around to the various offices with a Christmas card inside and saying, Merry Christmas, getting some very strange looks until they open the envelope and then hopefully happily receive that gift of love from our congregation. So we have them in the foyer uh, after church. If you have, uh, uh, if you're going to write a check, please make it out to the organization, not to the church. Um, but uh, otherwise we'll have them also downstairs when we go downstairs for fellowship afterwards. We're having Christmas treats after worship today and having a good time with one another. I think those are my announcements. Is there anything else we need to announce at this time? <coughs> Savior, how wonderful it is to be able to celebrate the birth of Christ, to know that his coming to us in human be as a human being is the blessed event that led to our salvation. How grateful we are, how exciting it is, Lord God, to be able to take some time today and remember that blessed event, to celebrate it together, and to renew, Lord God, our love for you and for, for one another. With gratitude in our hearts, we come to work together to worship this morning, and we give this time to you, our God and Father, as we pray in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Will you take your songbook, please, or your bulletin? Lift your voice in singing Joy to the World, 
and we will collect tithes and offerings as you sing.
that. Thank you for your singing. Now you may have noticed this gift here. I'm sorry to say it's for me. Oh. <laughs> Not for all of you. Well, it might be for them too, huh? You think? Oh, you never know. Well, it's it's hidden, so we'll we'll find out together. But Shelley has given me a belated birthday and pre-Christmas gift. <laughs> so let's take a look and see what it is. Wow. <laughs> That's cute. Thank you, Shelley. Well, so read what it says there, but it's a, so I can understand. Okay. It's a hat that says Pastor Warning. Anything you say or do could be used in a sermon. <laughs> so, you have been warned. <laughs> You're absolutely right. When she, when she gave it to me, I said, it's, it's not going to be anything embarrassing, is it? Like, like underwear. <laughs> she said, do you think I would do that? I said, no, but I would. <laughs> Thank you, Shelley. You're welcome. That's very cute. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer with that smile on our face, love in our hearts. Let's speak to him in a moment of silence, and then I'll lead you. We'll conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, how great it is to be able to come together and sing songs of praise, to share joy with one another, to be lifted up with your inspiring words of Scripture, to hear music that lifts our spirits and challenges us. And then also, Lord God, to be able to bring to you our heart's cry. To be able, Lord God, to find in you all we need to find that your supply is plentiful, great, gracious, <clears throat> more than we need. Thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ and Lord for all that he has done for us to make this day of celebration. There are things, Lord God, in our personal lives and in our national and international lives that cause us concern. Things that 
threaten to detract from our joy, distract us from our service, Lord God, discourage us from our faith. And it's only by your Spirit that we overcome these things. Father, we want to say thank you for our answered prayers regarding Rick and his procedure and that he's here with us today. We pray, Father, for Dave as he'll be having a medical procedure this week and for good information, good news, and healing. Father, we pray for Mavis and recovery from her injury. Our hearts go out across the country to Christine, Davis, Rebecca, Ariana, as they have observed and celebrated the life of Gabby Keaton. And we pray for all family members to feel, Lord God, your hand of blessing and comfort upon them. Indeed, upon all, Lord God, who are grieving. And Father, we pray for members of our extended church family who are fighting the good fight against cancer. For every gain and every setback, Lord God, for you to encourage them and strengthen them in their faith. And so we pray to uplift Carla and Karen and their families, knowing, Lord God, how serious these illnesses are and how deep is the joy, how strong is the faith that survives them. Thank you. pray for my father, Roger, today, who's in the hospital. Pray, Lord God, that we can find the means to correct this serotonin syndrome and restore dad's health. Pray for Myra Faye and for Kathy, Lord, that they might receive healing from your almighty hand. We lift up Dean to you as he's having a medical test this week and pray Father, for a good result. And indeed, Lord God, as we look around this room, as we think about all the things we have heard this week about goings on in the world, and our hearts skip a beat, if this were all we had, Father, if this world were the entirety of our hope, we would be a very forlorn people. But the testimony of Christmas, of Christ coming, is that the most real thing is you. The most realistic hope that we have is our hope of eternal life in you, our hope of one day Jesus coming again and appearing in the clouds to take us home to be with you. As we await that day, precious God, hear us lift up in one voice the prayer of Jesus who said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much for your prayers. Now we're going to be blessed by the ladies' trio singing a holiday appropriate hymn. Spirit of the day, my little red light went out. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Wonderful. I, I, that's one of my favorite Christmas hymns. So thank you so much. <coughs> All right. I'd like to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 24. The reading for it this morning is on page 1486.
While you're turning there, let me tell you about uh, the most expensive Christmas gift in history. I was curious about what might be identified as the most expensive gift in history, and I found uh, a rather curious story behind it. The answer to the question is the Orlov Diamond. Have you heard of that? I can see some heads nodding, okay. The Orlov Diamond was a Christmas gift to the Russian Empire's Catherine the Great. When, a, now let, let me say this right, when a 189.62 carat diamond, you're looking that, that big around and basically that shape, was given uh, to Catherine the Great by her lover, Count Orlov, hence the name, Orlov's Diamond. While some stories uh, say that that was a Christmas gift, the truth of the matter is that there was no way Orlov could have afforded such a massive gem, and so what really happened was Catherine the Great bought it. <laughs> had it installed on the royal scepter, gave it to Orlov, who then gave it back to her. So, really was a Christmas gift to herself, uh, thanks to the Russian people. And of course, the excesses of the royal house, the Romanovs, is part of what led to the revolution of 1917 and the coming of the Communist Party there in Russia. Our joy today is to recognize that the most precious gift, the really truly priceless gift, is God the Father's gift of Jesus the Son. His birth and life and death, resurrection, have made it possible for us to transcend the limitations of this earthly life and receive eternal life. His presence is the greatest present. Of all. Let's look at this passage then and, and see in this uh, how we need to reorder our priorities according to this wonderful truth. Jesus taught his disciples and in verse 19 of chapter 6 said, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Your eye is like a lamp, that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. We'll stop here and examine this teaching of Jesus. We're going to note today that God blesses every heart that is his. We see in this passage three truths. We'll start with number one, where Jesus commands us to put our treasure where our heart is and put our heart in heaven. Verses 19 to 21. You see, Jesus said there is a problem with earthly treasures in verse 19. They are not secure. They are not lasting. They are temporary and unreliable and a 
not a good, firm basis for your life. The normal processes of nature, after all, as he cites an example, moths and rust, they corrupt things of this world. They make them worthless. The envy and greed of others makes them vulnerable to thievery. Jesus said, time and other people are not on your side. And ultimately, he didn't say this, but we know it's true, ultimately, death will make all your possessions completely worthless. You can't, as it turns out, take it with you. So trusting earthly treasures will make you insecure. And it's an irony how many times we go to earthly treasures to try to find security. We hope that money in the bank will provide us security. Or investments. And yet we find that we don't feel secure, that they uh, rise and fall, and in a moment can be gone. Jesus also pointed out, on the other hand, the advantages of heavenly treasures. In contrast, heavenly treasures have the advantage of being perfectly secure. Heavenly treasures are exempt from natural forces like moths and rust. Heavenly treasures cannot be stolen as they are placed under God's secure, perfect trust. Trusting heavenly treasures will give you perfect security, peace, and comfort. In verse 21, he explains why these contrasting things are important. He said it's because of human nature. Because the things that we treasure are the desires of our heart, and they become our greatest priority our most persuasive passion. To make earthly things the object of your fondest desire, your first priority, your greatest passion, is to invest your precious life in something that will break your heart and fail to truly satisfy it. Earthly things are utterly meaningless where the afterlife is concerned. The best and noblest things of this earth are still only temporary. The better choice is to make heavenly things the object of your fondest desire, your first priority, and your greatest passion. And you do this by investing your precious life in things God has commanded and approved. In this life, these things strengthen your heart and are truly satisfying. They are trustworthy for the afterlife because they are of God and will stand for all eternity. Second, Jesus commands, keep your eye on God's glory. Focus your gaze. Give your attention to the presence of God in your life. And he tells us, uh, he switches a, a figure of speech here. He had been talking about the heart, and now he's talking about the eye. And he is using the eye in the same way that he used the heart. It just sounds a little different. And what he's teaching us here, especially in verse 22, is what you look at becomes part of you. What you choose in your daily life to focus your attention on, what you give time to, what you give money to, becomes part of you. And so, in a paradox, in an irony, the things we possess also to some degree 
possess us, don't they? They all demand time and attention. Jesus is here saying the same truth in a slightly different way. He's talking about what we prioritize, the things that delight us, and he speaks about the eye in a way that is scientifically accurate. He says, if your eye is healthy, you'll be able to see and light will enter into your body. And that's really true. That's what science tells us. The eye is the part of a human body that receives wavelengths of light and then the, sends that through the nerves to the brain, which interprets these wavelengths, and we see. He said, if your eye is healthy, you can see. If your eye is unhealthy, you can't see. It's blindness. It's darkness. But in that same way of using this as a figure of speech, Jesus is saying that if you are using your eye to look to God, if you are looking to heaven, if you are looking to eternity in your thinking and in your daily living, that's healthy is the word he uses here, could just as easily be holy. And so the more you look upon God, the more you look upon his word, the more you pray, and the more time you spend in fellowship with other believers, the healthier you become. But Jesus said the opposite is also true. The more that your eye falls upon the things of this world, the things that are evil, the things that distract, discourage, and trouble you, then the more you will put that in your heart. You know, when we talk about computers, the saying is, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't put the right information in the computer, it's not going to give you the right result, no matter how many times you run it. You've got to have it factual and practical and working before you will get the result that you seek. But look at verse 23 because Jesus is giving a warning here. The end of verse 3, that last sentence has to do with hypocrisy. It has to do with perception. And he says, and if you aren't careful, you might miss this. And if the light you think you have. Now don't miss those two words. You think. If the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep is that darkness? Jesus is warning us here. Don't fool yourself. You have to actually make the choice to look at the light. You have to make the choice to let that light come into you and change you. It's not enough to give lip service to the light. It's not enough to fool others or fool yourself. Make it real. Look at the things that are good for eternity. The third thing we see in this passage, the third command that Jesus gives is very simple, make your choice. He's been contrasting these two things, light and darkness, heavenly treasures, earthly treasures. And he says, make your choice because it's impossible to live with divided loyalties. We cannot stay on the fence in this life. Now he says in verse 24 that we, no one can serve two masters. So he's taking another figure of speech, now a third figure of speech, and he's using it as an example. And here's what he's saying to us. Divided loyalties are not just bad for you, if you could do them, but they're impossible to do. Impossible. You cannot serve two 
masters, period. Now, he illustrated this principle with slavery, a practice common in his day. And he said, no slave belongs to two owners. If that were possible legally, it would be unworkable personally. For Jesus said that you would hate one and love the other. You would be devoted to one and despise the other. Now, we may like to think that we're smart enough to have divided loyalties. Or we may compartmentalize our life and at work we have a, a certain character and demeanor. And then at church we have another one and at home we have another one. And uh, we compartmentalize so much that it's almost as if we have multiple personalities. Jesus said, that's impossible. You really are the same person. You're just pretending to be something else. In fact, Jesus used money as an example. He said, you cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. You cannot be God's servant and the world's servant at the same time. You must choose. Now, he used money as an example, but just about anything in this world can divide our loyalty. Even things that on the surface are good, like love of family. There was a time in the Gospels when Jesus was approached by his mother and his brothers. And the Jewish law under which he lived and honored said, honor your father and mother. So when they appeared, the honorable thing for Jesus would have been to conceivably to stop his teaching and rush to his mother's side and find out what she wanted. But instead, he looked at his disciples and he said, you are my family. And in another occasion, he even said, unless you hate your father and mother. You can have no part in it. Now that's very radical teaching and he was using a bit of exaggeration there to emphasize that he wasn't urging us to hate our parents. But the point simply is this, you, even if something is good in moral terms, but it is worldly in its character, you cannot inherit the kingdom. Of God. That cannot be the priority for your life. When God is our priority, we understand the world and everything in it in accordance with His point of view. When God is our priority, we use money and material resources as ways and means to bring glory to Him. When God is our priority, we respond to people with love. When God is our priority, we submit to the Spirit and to the Word of God and allow it to guide our life. You see, Jesus didn't talk about money because he was a fundraiser. We have zero evidence in the Gospels that Jesus ever took an offering, that Jesus ever asked for support. We know that he received it. It would have been probably practically impossible for him to have had three years of ministry without financial and physical support. But nonetheless, that was never a focus of his ministry. And yet, he spoke more often about money than any other single subject. And that's because he knows our nature. And he knows that there is a nerve that connects our heart to our wallet. And it can be pretty sensitive. That's why he said, you cannot be enslaved to evil and serve God. You see, God blesses every heart that is holy. His. 
Why don't you do me a little favor as we conclude here? I'd like you to write down these capital letters on your message notes. Get a pen or a pencil if you haven't been, and write down these letters. Ready? W. Y. S. W. Y. G. Okay, I'll review that. W Y S I W Y G. That's an acronym. I'll tell you what it means. What you see is what you get. It's pronounced WYSIWYG. And I love this term. It's related to computers. And it's the ability of a particular application or program to give you a view of what a document will look like when you print it out without actually printing it out. So what you see on the screen is what you get. WYSIWYG. Blogger Martha Chalker explained WYSIWYG in this helpful way. She said, and I quote, what you see is what you get, or WYSIWYG refers to the ability of a computer screen to display an accurate rendition of the finished page. However, I've always used the term to describe individuals who I consider authentic and true to themselves in a healthy way. End quote. Now I'm going to speak to some of you who are older. Remember Flip Wilson and his Geraldine disguise? Honey, what you see is what you get. Now, he did not coin that term, by the way. It was already in use when Flip Wilson, the comedian, came around. But it's also useful for teaching, uh, the teaching of Jesus in this section. And he says, what we choose to look at with our eyes, to dwell on with our minds, to desire in our heart, that's the what you see part. The effect that it has on us as a person, the effect on our spiritual life, as we dwell on those things, that's the what you get part. Perhaps it will be helpful to think of this life as a time we invest in eternal life. We are given precious moments every day, and we have an opportunity to invest them, to use them in a way that honors and glorifies God. And the more we choose to do that, the stronger we become in our faith, and the more God or other people see God in us. So let's remember then, very simply, the pri our priorities in life. God is first, others second, self third, and stuff last. Amen. Amen. Oh, come, all you faithful. Let's rise to our feet. Let's offer this song of praise to the Lord. And uh, I want to remind you that we're gathering downstairs after worship to enjoy each other's company some more and celebrate this Christmas in July. 249, if you please.
and make him known. Amen.